morning. It is so good to see you today here at service. Welcome to Redeemer's Church. Hey, if this is your first time here, I'd like to invite you to fill out the communication card that you can find just right under the seat in front of you. You can fill it out and turn it in at the offering receptacles on your way out after service, or you can drop it off at the information center, which is at the gazebo outside in the quad area. And if you turn it in there, you will get a Redeemer's Church mug and also a voucher for a Misio Day coffee. You can also find the form online at redeemerschurch.com slash new. If you take a screenshot of that form, you can show the barista at Misio Day and you will also get a free drink. We also have a Redeemer's Church app and you can download that right now if you have not already done so. Just head to redeemerschurch.com and right on the homepage, just scroll down and there's a link for you to download the app there. With the app, you will be able to follow along with today's sermon notes, check out the events going on throughout the week, and you can also give online at any time. And some other ways that we have for you to give at your convenience are the offering receptacles located at the front entrance of the worship center, or you can utilize our text to give feature. Again, we are also grateful that you are joining us this morning. Hey, Megan. Um, oh, sorry. Oh, oh, sorry. So, Megan, can I make copies? Oh. Enter. It's like 35 degrees outside. What's wrong with you? Megan, you always got to be ready for summer camp. You know this. Sorry. Hey, good morning, Redeemers. You guys ready for the word? Good. Hey, before I get going, I want to give you a few quick announcements. Uh, today, after church, come join us. We have a community church picnic. Just come on out. We have hot dogs. If you don't like hot dogs, go grab something and bring it back. Um, seriously, it's, it's meant to be a relaxed thing. It's not a huge event. It's meant for us to hang out. We're going to have volleyball, cornhole, uh, football, I think. Um, and if you don't want to do any of those things, you can hang out, sit on a bench, and talk to each other, you know? Uh, so it's going to be fun, but we also want you to go outside and check out the booths. At the booths, you're going to see two major things we're pushing right now. Community groups, which is this, as we walk through these Beatitudes, you know, one of the things you don't want to miss is that the first thing Jesus is doing, yes, he's teaching, yes, he's edifying, but he's doing it with a group of people that always follow him around and grow together as disciples, and so we have to be connected in community for growth. It's just, it, it's an essential. It cannot be done alone. That's what the scriptures teach us. So go out, check that out. If you're not involved in that or you just want to take a break from that, we also have relationship rehab on Monday nights. That is for everybody. Uh, it, it is for married people, but it's also for those who maybe have a spouse, but they aren't here or who can't make it. Uh, it's for those who are single. It's for those who are divorced or widowed or whatever it might be. You can come and learn about how to get healthy in your relationships. I talked a lot about it last week, but it is a, it, to me, is not just another marriage thing. It is an essential thing you need to understand about your relational styles, how we relate, how it relates us to God. And you'll find out that some of the cycles and issues you have in your relationships is also the same cycles you have with God. And that's what's amazing about it. And you'll get to the core of that and why is there this impediment of me growing closer with people in, the, in my closest relationships over and over again. So I want you to come out, check that out. This is the last week. We start tomorrow night. I will be helping lead that one with a few others. And then on Wednesday night, if you are not in a community group, but you want to just show up, we have groups on campus, including one for men, uh, mixed groups that you can just come on campus and join in, and we'll have a spot for you. But just let us know if you can so we get a heads up of who's coming and sign up at the tables. All right, you guys got that? Yeah. One more thing. We are going to shut down our children's program because nobody wants to serve. What do you think? No? No, I know that can't happen. So we don't have enough people to serve. And I know we're all coming out of covid and I know it's weird and it's hard to get back into the groove, but that can't be us. We are here to contribute to the future of this church and the leadership and the faith of our children. And we are now expanding to do Wednesday nights so we can reach kids in the community who can be invited. So, guys, we need you to serve. We need you to step up. It can be once a month on rotation. It can be whatever you want it to be. It can be Wednesday nights. It can be Sundays. But we can't get to this place where we don't have a capacity to invest into the next generation of this church. That's what we're about. 
right? We got to look into the future and say, what is, what are, how are we raising up our children? And we have an amazing thing. Steph's been working hard at creating a curriculum that engages kids on every style of learning. And yet, we have to have people alongside of her. So I need you to go outside to our serve booth and find the ways that you can get connected, find your fit, and find a way to contribute to the kingdom uh, so that we can not just have a program that works, but is flourishing. Amen? I need you to not, don't just sit there and go, hey, somebody else will do it. If that were the case, I wouldn't be up here saying it. Amen? It's, it's you, right? It, it's just coming in and loving and investing into those in ways that God wants to serve you to raise up these young people. It is not just a side babysitting project. This is the investment of the most crucial times of their life of how they're going to come to know Christ and live in that. So we need to step up and do that together. That needs to be a quality and character of what it means to be at Redeemers. Amen? All right, I got something special today. Jeff, will you come on up? <clears throat> Half of you probably don't know Jeff. Most of, half of you probably do. Uh, for those who don't, um, Jeff served this church for two and a half years. Uh, when I took over, I had never pastored, and he came alongside of me and helped me figure this thing out. He was our executive pastor. Uh, he has been a mentor and a friend to me and a very special person in my life. Uh, he randomly showed up this week into my office, and uh, it was such a blessing and good to see him. Um, and he is doing something special. Uh, he's part of a church covering we call Converge. That is also what Redeemers is now under. And uh, Jeff is preparing to plant a church in Kauai, in Hawaii. Yeah, well, but he is reaching out to some of the most unchurched. It is an incredibly unchurched area, uh, a place where there's heavy alcoholism and drug use. And so, yes, it is beautiful, and it is filled with people who need Jesus. And so uh, Jeff is going back there. He's actually got family connections where he grew, uh, his he history and heritage is in Hawaii. Uh, so there's a lot of cool things. He and his wife, uh, Lisa, are getting ready to move completely there in July. So what I want to do is one of our five C's is to pray over people and commission them into what God's having them do and sending them. And Jeff is such a special part of our history here and mine. And so I just wanted to pray over him. All right. God, thank you so much. If you'll just extend your hand. Lord, thank you so much for Jeff. Thank you for the role you've brought him into my life. Uh, Lord, thank you for the role he's played here in helping us just grow and build a foundation for growth as you've just kept us healthy through these years. Uh, Lord God, thank you for the gifts you've given him, for, the, uh, for his mind, for his heart, his compassion for the lost, for the poor. Um, God, thank you just all the ways you have created him and Lisa and all the giftings you've given them, Lord, um, it is no easy task to plant a new thing in a place where people don't know you and want you even sometimes. Uh, Lord God, I pray every blessing on him. I pray every door, even though you are already starting to open ones, Lord. So I pray even more so, Lord, that you just find miraculous ways to give him everything he needs financially, physically, but also in those connections to people, Lord God, that you would grow his church, that you would grow your church. Lord God, this is yours, and you are using Jeff uh, to grow people in your name. And so, Lord God, we pray for safe travels. We pray for that things work out, that they would find health together uh, in their family. We pray for their extended family, as there will be a distance, that they will still stay close and growing. And um, God, I just thank you. He has blessed so many, Lord. So we pray, all hands raised, Lord, we pray just huge blessings on him, Lord God, that as you send him, you will give him everything he needs uh, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, man. I love you. All right. Yeah. You talk to him after service if you want to go with him. <laughs> Why isn't he preaching? He's, he surprised me. He should have preached. <laughs> um. All right, guys, we've been in this series, The Second Mountain. I'm going to give you a quick little recap of what we've covered. Uh, we talked about this metaphor from this book titled, namely, The Second Mountain. Um, and it was this metaphor that I found amazing. It was this study. It's not even a Christian book, per se, though the person who wrote it became a Christian recently. Um, it, is, it was 
this idea that on the first mountain is this idea that we've been raised in society to be all about this constantly getting to the top, individualism, all about success, all about getting what I need, what I want, what I desire, and then it does not work. You either get to the top and realize, is this all there is? But most of us either struggle over and over again like the boulder up a hill to push it and it falls back and we start over, push it and we get exhausted, or we fall off, or it falls apart. And it, you realize at some point it doesn't work. And you go through these valleys of suffering over and over again, realizing that it doesn't work. And then he says, there's the second mountain. There's these people that when you enter the room, they just change your soul. Like there's something about them that when they look at you, when they ask you questions, there's something simple yet deep. There's a weightiness to them. They, that they care about people, that you can tell they're not concerned with themselves, but concerned about the world around them, that there's a depth. And he says, these are second mountain people. And as I thought about this book and how amazing it was, it is much like this mountain on the Beatitudes. We talked about how Jesus went through the temptations on one mountain to make the whole mission of God about him. Get your kingdom. Make things, uh, meet your needs. Be all about you, Jesus. And he had to face that temptation. But on the second mountain, following in Matthew 5, he goes and gives this sermon called the, Beat- uh, I'm sorry, called the Sermon on the Mount. And he gathers his disciples and he says, this is what it looks like to know me. And it is everything opposite of the first mountain that we're raised in, in our culture, in our society. It is upside down. It is backwards. It is everything you would not think based on how we are raised with our values. And he says, if you know me, here's what it will look like to be a Christ follower. And so we've been in the first section of this called the Beatitudes for the last three weeks. And if you notice, there's a lot of similarities to these. Today, we did for, in the first week, we did Blessed Are the Poor in Spirit. Last week, it was a very popular sermon. <laughs> Blessed are those who mourn. It was a heavy one. And then this week, it is Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And we talked about the idea that this word blessed isn't used the way we use it culturally, like I got stuff for me, God took care of my needs per se. This word blessed is actually, a D.A. Carson, we said, talked about this, this is about having God's approval, like standing before God and, and realizing that he loves you, adores you, and approves of you, that you are made right in him, and that there is no greater blessing that could be had than that. And so he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the, those who mourn and blessed are the meek. And I, it was hard as you prepare to preach this because it's like, these are all very similar. You know, first we talk about this idea of being blessed, poor in spirit. It's this idea that as I mentally stand before God, I said this last week, poor in spirit is more this view I have of God. Like, man, I do not deserve to be before God. I, you know, like he is way greater than me. And it's this idea of not thinking highly of ourselves. But it is a way we think. And then we talked about mourning is like the second part of that. It moves from the head to the affections. I now know, know not only mentally that, you know what, my life isn't the center of all things. Like God, is, I need God. I desperately need him. I cannot do this mountain stuff by myself. But then the mourning is when it comes into the affections. And I start weeping over my own sin. And then I start weeping over the brokenness of the world. So now it's in the heart. Well, meekness is like that, except it's moved to humanity. So if you look at it, this, all three of these are the qualities of a char- and character of a Christian is about humility. And the poor in spirit was about humility in the head. I understand myself in where I stand before God and others, and I am not more important. I am not greater than others. In fact, I desperately need God and others in this life. Mourners are humility in the heart. Lord God, I'm weeping. It's actually affected. I don't just know you. Like, I feel it. I desperately, in weeping and mourning, need you to save me, Lord. And that's where it changes us. You can know a lot of things about God. It will not change you until you learn to mourn your own sin and the brokenness and hurts and pains and sin of the world around you. And that changes you. But if it changes you, then you will be meek. There will be a humility amongst humanity. That means as the way you interact with people will change. So if you say, oh, I know this about my relationship to God, oh, I need a Savior, but it doesn't change horizontally in your relationships to those around you and how you treat people, something's been missed. 
Something hasn't changed and transformed in the way I know Christ. So that's what we're talking about today, our humility amongst humanity. When you hear meek, I don't know what you think of, but I want to talk about what meekness looks like. First off, when we hear meek, we probably often think of somebody who's just like really small, really mousy, that's good, yeah, really unimportant, oh, I don't want to talk to anybody. Meekness, let me be clear, meekness is not weakness. Meekness is not meek weakness. It tells us in the scriptures that Jesus Christ was meek. Jesus Christ calls you to be meek. He says a follower of Christ will be meek, and the meek will inherit the earth. That sounds powerful. It is not weakness. So what is it? It is not about those who are simply powerless. It's those who probably could have power, but they choose to relinquish it for the sake of God and others. That is meekness. Um, I've quoted D.A. Carson a few times because I enjoy his writing, but today I want to share a message or a, a, a quote from him. He is interesting. He says, some people are just naturally nice and easygoing. You might think of that as meekness. But then again, so are some dogs. Meekness is much deeper. Meekness is the controlled desire to see the other's interest advance ahead of one's own. You hear that? Like it's not about simply being passively nice. And sometimes we kind of put on those airs as Christians. We want to appear meek. Meekness is about submitting your desires. Not because you're trying to be without and suffer, but because you really truly want to see God's interests and others' interests above your own. That is the transformation of what God does in our lives with others. So how do we get meekness from Christ? And I'm going to give you one perspective and I'm going to Share it throughout the whole thing. How do we get meekness? I'm going to say there's a lot of ways. It's namely through your closeness and relationship to Christ, but it comes from an eternal perspective. I'm going to explain what I mean by that, but hold on to that idea. It comes from an eternal perspective, and here's what I mean. The reason I cannot be meek is because I am so focused on me, on the now, on the world around me, on my boundaries, on what I need, on my possessions, on the stuff that will make me happy, successful, and not feeling like I'm losing or losing something. An eternal perspective looks at what God has created us for. It looks to Jesus as what is the end game? What is the goal of this world? It looks to his promises. It sees something way above the instant moment. You know, we live in this grand history of time. And depending on how you view it, regardless, biblically, 3,500 years of civilization, uh, you look back at since, you know, since Genesis was written, or billions of years, but you go through this history of time, and you get so lost in the moment. Everything matters now because of how it affects me. With an eternal perspective, you realize God has created the earth and created you for this much grander transcendent thing and purpose called the kingdom of God, Jesus, and Jesus Christ. And you realize there's a greater spiritual thing going on than what happens to you now. And that will allow meekness to take root in your life. And I'm going to explain how. D.A. Carson continues from the same section. He says, individually, each man tends to assume without thinking that he is at the center of the universe. Therefore, he, listen to this, therefore he relates poorly to the four billion others who are laboring under the similar delusion. Right? You cannot get along because of how you see yourself in the center of all this huge thing going on. But the meek man sees himself and all others as under God, this transcendent purpose, this transcendent being. Whatever strength or weakness the meek person has is accompanied by a humility and a genuine dependence and submission on, to God. Okay? I think another way to put this is that meekness is determined by a true estimate of ourselves before God. See, it is because I have a high view of myself that I am not meek. When I understand my perspective before God, this eternal person, this creator, before Jesus, 
who transcends all of time and history yet loves me personally. I understand my place in the universe. I understand my place amongst you. When I don't consider him, I don't have a true estimate of myself. I am either much greater or much worse than I can imagine, than I should imagine, right? I, I, I stand before others and judge them like God himself, like I'm God himself. I think that my needs are the all-encompassing important thing that I need to live by. That the way I define who I am as a person is the center of my life. That the way I feel is the center of everything I do. That every moment that I feel something, I have to act upon. Because I have a limited perspective of myself instead of a true estimate of where I stand before God. Then it goes into this second part. It says, blessed are the meek, and this part's weird, for they will inherit the earth. What does that mean? The meek will inherit the earth. All right, so there's some background on this. <clears throat> this phrase comes from the Old Testament, where it says the very same thing throughout the Bible and in Psalms. And it's tied to this idea of a covenant promise. Israel when they were saved out of slavery by God, and he leads them through the desert, he gave them a promised land. And he says, for you will inherit this land if you are meek, if you love me, if you dedicate yourself, if you submit yourself to me, if you are committed to my ways, I will give you this land. Now, what is this land? It's not just about gaining some property. This isn't about securing a new place where you can build nice housing or new subdivisions. The land represented this idea of this place, this boundary, where God is their supreme leader, where he is king, where he is the one in control and leading them, and they will be blessed, and that in this land, you will be blessed by God, you will be loved by God, you will be led by God in a place where your needs will be met, that your desires will be fulfilled by God's love, that he will be your king, that you will be his people. There was this incredible promise that you would be with God when you got this promised land, okay? But he says, listen, in Psalm 37, he says, commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him. Commit your way to the Lord. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn. He will make your vindication like the noonday sun. Man, all those problems I have with other people, he will vindicate you when you are living with him in unity. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret. Do not live in this constant anxious worry when people succeed in their ways. When the wicked are doing well around you and you're jealous, when they carry out their wicked schemes and you're feeling slighted and wronged, refrain from anger and turn for wrath. But how do you do that? That's meekness. He says, do not fret. It leads only to evil. He says, for those who are evil will be destroyed, and those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. You see, all this stuff you're watching around you that makes you angry, that has fallen apart, that you're afraid of, that you're anxious about, it's going to come to nothing. Those who can trust in the Lord, commit their ways to God, they can be meek and trust him that all things will be fulfilled in the promises of God if you cling to him. You will inherit the promises of God. A little while. See, right now you're focused on the wicked, but in a little while, not very long, the wicked will be no more. Though you look for them, they will not be found. These things are passing away that you're so worried and fretting about. But the meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. Amen? Yet most of us are not meek. What a promise. And yet I'm not in it because I'm not meek. So how do we get there? God's people didn't it's an interesting thing because this is given, uh, Psalms is reciting this, these promises that are throughout the whole Bible. God's promise of the promised land, that the, if you commit your way to God, this is constant throughout the Old Testament. And yet the stories of Israel tell us that they did not inherit the land. 
Like they got there eventually, but the people he was talking to in the desert as we've made that connection at Mount Sinai, they didn't. Here's why. Two things happened. On one front, he, they finally get to the edge of this promised land that God had promised them. And he says, now, he goes, go in. Go take the land. Trust me. Commit your way to me. I will make this what I've promised, and I will be your God, and you will be my people. And this place will be flowing with everything you need. Every desire that you need will be fulfilled through God. And they said no. They didn't want to go. You know why? Because there were scary people there. And they were tall. They all looked like Jeff. (laughs) Every one of them. So imagine just thousands of Jeffs and a bunch of midgets. Sorry, little people. And they all said, no, we're not going because I'm worried. And those people are wicked. And it's not going to work. So, you know, they ended up wandering around the desert for 40 years because of that. Because they wouldn't go in and trust God and commit their ways to God all the way through, trusting him, submitting to him. Because they were afraid that things would not be fair and work out in their favor. But then there's a second part where he goes, okay, you know what? You were not ready, so you're going to Travel around for 40 years, and you know what? I'll give my promises to your ancestors, but you're not getting them because you have rejected and not committed your ways to God. But then later they go, no, we can do it. We're ready. I don't want to lose the promise. But he said, no, it's not for you anymore. It's for your next of kin. And they forced their way in. And they, that led to tragedy as well. Disaster, brokenness, idolatry, and death. They forced their way in when God said no. So they wouldn't go when God said go, and they forced their way in when God said no. One way or the other, it doesn't matter. They weren't meek. They didn't submit themselves to God. They didn't commit themselves to his way. That is actually the fundamental problem. It doesn't matter if you go or you say no. Both of them are, I don't trust you to lead me. I cannot submit myself to you. And that is the essence of what changes every area of our lives. You know, I talked about this, so just to repeat it, like, I think I shared it two sermons ago. It's like this idea that we are changed by God, not by changing our behaviors, right? And if I'm working by my own power to change my behaviors, I can maybe be nice in, like, one situation where it's easier for me, but give, put me in the wrong situation, and all this other ugliness is going to come out. But when God is transforming you, Every area of your life begins to change incrementally. That's what we talked about. It'll subtly change from your kids to your spouse to your work relationships. Everything will begin to change because God's changing your spirit, your humility overall. Just because you did five steps to better communication doesn't mean you're a greater loving person and more humble. So you can fix a area of your life but if it's in your own power, it's, going, it's not going to change and transform every area of your life. So what does? And this is where it sounds cliche, but we need to get it. Submission to God. What does that mean? Submission to God changes our approach towards everything. And it is one of the hardest things we do in our lives. We are like the Israelites. God says, go, and I say, I'm busy. I'm scared. I have other plans. God says, for I know the plans I have for you. And we go, yeah, God, I know the plans I have for you. We echo him. We don't submit. God says no, and we go because it feels good, because it seems like it's what I wanted. We have a trouble because in our society, we are first mountain people. I am here to climb my mountain, not allow God to take me up his. Not allow God to do what he will with me. And it doesn't change us. And so we work on these little things. I'm going to get healthier. I'm going to be nicer. I'm going, and we change maybe little bits here or there, but nothing really changes. Nothing transforms. Because one quality has been lacking. I am not submitted to the God and this transcendent purpose and kingdom. And therefore, I change with my society. I don't really transform. So a few things 
that when we submit ourselves to God, here's what changes. Number one, you will no longer think of personal rights the same if you are submitted to God. Your personal rights actually become pretty null and void. And that offends our culture and our society and our understanding of ourselves, especially today more than ever. This idea that I define my own reality and my own rights, or I deserve, I deserve, I deserve. Before God, it changes you and your meekness because I'm submitted to God. So if he says something, and it's not exactly the way I would determine it for myself, it changes. But it changes me because I can accept that. It's not about my personal rights anymore. That's no longer the value that drives me. There's a theologian named Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, and he says, When we know God, we are to leave everything, ourselves, our rights, our cause, our whole future in the hands of God, and especially so if we feel we are suffering unjustly. Do you see that? Out. But, hey, here's an out. He doesn't mean that if it applies to your politics. It doesn't apply. Because that's really unjust. He doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that if it means, like, you know, unfairness in your taxation. No, it does. It means these things become unimportant. Like, these stupid, trivial things that I'm so lost in because in the very moment they affect how I feel and how I'm afraid and my money and my possessions, which are rotting, and they're going to rot whether I get who I want or don't get who I want or things go my way or don't go my way, they all rot. And we are consumed by our rights, by our desires, by our view of the world, and we fail to see the eternal perspective. But when I see his cause, when I understand his future, which includes all peoples of the earth coming to know Jesus, when I understand what his call to righteousness is, I'm not as concerned about my rightness. And I can let go of certain things. See, it doesn't become about me anymore. And we live on the first mountain where everything is about me. Everything is about how I feel, about my cause, about the things I believe should happen and here's how it should happen. And yet God has a way of being. He has a call. He has a purpose that transcends history and time and cultures and boundaries and borders. God loves America, but I hate to break it to you, he loves every portion of his earth that he's created. Not more than the others. It transcends time. It transcends everything. It's transcendent. So we can let go. I think a good way to put this is there should be no me in meek. Eek. Thanks. <laughs> there should be no me in meek. I lose myself, not because I don't matter to God or that I'm worse than everybody else, but because, gosh, I've been created for something much bigger. The other thing it changes when we're submitted to God is we're submitted to promises he's already given us. Like, it's not that you just submit like a slave and go, well, I'm going to lose everything and I won't get what I... That's not what it's saying. It's that God has already promised you things. Just like he already promised the Israelites, like, I'm going to take care of you. Just trust me. I'm going to provide what you need. In fact, it's going to be greater than what you think you need. I'm going to be your God. I'm going to lead you. You're not going to have to worry about all this other stuff you're so afraid about and angry about and fighting about and quarreling about. You're not going to have to worry about whether you're going to eat. I'm going to provide for you. Because in the kingdom of God, he is my father and he takes care of his children. So you know what this does is it changes our relationship to possessions. So it changes our relationship to personal rights. Like that is not the chief aim of your life. You don't have to fight that battle. But oh yeah, there are possessions, which is why we fight. Everything is about boundaries for us. Who's, in, who's infringing upon my boundaries, my stuff, my rights, my, my housing, 
my work and how, what it's produced, my success. You know, there's this part in 2 Corinthians where Paul's, it's a famous passage where he goes, you know, we are hurting, but we are not in despair. Like he's talking about what it means to be Christians. Like we are suffering, but we are not hopeless. And he goes on in verse 10 in chapter 6. He says, we are sorrowful, yet we are always rejoicing. We are poor, yet we are making many rich. Having nothing, and yet we, possess, we are possessing everything. We are possessing everything. What does he mean? We are poor, yet making many rich. You see his perspective there? He's like, yeah, we don't have a lot of money, but you should see what we're doing for the whole humanity for the rest of the world, for all of time. People are coming to know Christ. There's salvation. There are blessings. There is miracles. There is healing. Yeah, we're poor, I guess. But you know what's greater? We are making many rich. See the perspective? It goes outside of themselves. Trusting that God will provide, because that's the promise. God never says, you're going to die of hunger if you serve me. He says, I will provide what you need. But you don't have to stress and cling and fight and work yourself to the bone when you throw yourself into my hands and serve me and lead with me and help people. I will provide. And he says we are possessing everything. What does that mean? It means that what God has promised is both here and eternal. That he will give you love the way you need. That he will build a security within you that no amount of money can give you. That he will help you build value both here and to eternity. You will find worth that your work and your stuff can never produce. At least for any amount of serious time. Only the genuine meek man will be content. And most of us are not. A meek person, their ego is not so inflated that they think they must always have more. In Christ, they already see themselves as possessing everything. I have everything I need. Give me, poverty nor, give me not poverty nor riches, it says in Proverbs. Just give me what I need to serve the Lord. Give me what I need to be fulfilled. Give me what I need to love well. Give me what I need to complete the tasks you've given me. That's the prayer, because the perspective is not, will I have enough? Will I need more? Can I get more? Can my house be nicer? The perspective is, God, we're making many rich. I love it. There's an eternal thing going on here, and that's what I'm dedicated to. So give me poverty. Give me riches. It doesn't really matter. Just give me what I need so I can see this transcendent purpose of yours, this kingdom of God, this Jesus be made known to the nations, to the world, to my friends around me. You know, it makes me think of like, because we get angry. We get angry about stuff. I mean, let's be real. We make it all about a lot of other things, but generally it's about people infringing on my stuff. So Michelle and I, you know, we used to live in a high crime community as part of our ministry. And there were these kids we would bring into our house, these teenagers, and we would host these programs where we'd bring them into our house and do Bible studies and sports things and hang out with them, and one night, um, I came home from a trip that I did with all these kids, this uh, field trip in our nonprofit, and when I got home, our front door was wide open, and all of our electronics and all of our stuff had been broken into, our windows broken, everything stolen, and we found out that the kids who did it were kids that we had had into our home. And I remember facing this conflict, like, gosh, dang it. I have loved these kids, and they stole everything from me. Like, I've served these kids. And they broke into my house. And I knew who they were. And I had a right to go turn them in, send them to prison, whatever it is. And we wrestled with it. How do I respond? 
And my stuff, man, there's not, it feels so awful to see somebody go through all your stuff, all your clothes poured out and your house torn up. Like there is something so, gosh, just, ugh. And yet you ask yourself, and then you also have this other thought, which is why am I here? If I'm doing all this, why am I living down here? I don't need this. What about my rights? What about my success? What about my stuff? But you got to have an eternal perspective. What are we here for? Yeah, three kids out of the 800 we served over years broke in and stole my stuff. A, there are 797 more that still need love for the kingdom of God. And it cost me four. $4,500 according to insurance of stuff. That's okay. You can have my stuff. You know? But if I am about my stuff then the, and not the kingdom of God, then I'm so offended, so hurt. I get out. I put them in prison. I give them their due. Right? Right? And on the other end, I also sat there and prayed for those kids. And I got to actually see them and tell them, I know you took my stuff, but I forgive you. I don't know what happened to them. I keep a picture in my office to remember to pray for them all the time because these kids were abandoned. They were in gangs. They were struggling because the kingdom of God is bigger than our Xboxes and iPads and clothes. And yeah, it offends the senses. And yet, and I'm not telling you you shouldn't be offended and act like you're Gandhi. I'm telling you, be offended and then remember that the kingdom of God is bigger than all of this. And submit yourself to what he would have you do. And then you can let loose. Then you can forgive. Then you can hold things loosely. That's, I'm not saying I'm meek. I'm saying at that moment, that's what God was leading me in. I'm not as meek as I would like to be, trust me. What I am saying is that is what it reminds me of, of you got to hold your stuff loosely. That is meekness amongst humanity. And then lastly, this gets to the heart of it, right? It changes the way we relate to people. When I'm submitted to God, it changes the way I relate relate to people and the power I can or hope to have over them. See, on the first mountain, we are about getting to the top, and often that's in competition with others. And anybody who pulls me back, makes it slower, makes it harder, puts impediments in my way, I get angry. I get ticked. Because you're infringing on my ability to be more successful, or you're making things uncomfortable, you're causing me problems, and I, that's where I lash out and get angry and abuse my power over others if I have it. Or try to have it. But when I'm submitted to God, I see myself before God. Right? right? It's having a true estimate of yourself. And almost anything anybody would do to me, I do also to people, but I also do to God. And I cannot stand and be self-righteous if I have a true estimate my, of, of myself as I'm submitted to God. And that's meekness. I can let go of these things that are slights against me in my relationships because, not because they don't matter, not because your feelings don't matter, but because they are submitted to something much greater. John Stott is this, also this author and theologian, biblical scholar, and he says, I myself am quite happy to recite the general confession in church and call myself a miserable sinner. You guys, turn to your neighbor, say, I'm a miserable sinner. <laughs> yeah, that's easy enough. Now, how many of you meant it? Yeah, we'll see. I can stand in church and call myself, oh, God, I need you. I'm a miserable sinner. It causes me no great problem. I can take it in stride. Anybody here, if you're a believer already, you've probably said some prayer of the Lord, forgive me. Lord, save me from my sin. That's awesome. You can do that. But let somebody else come up to me after church and call me a miserable sinner, and I want to punch them on the nose. In other words, I am not prepared to allow other people to think or speak of me what I have just acknowledged before God that I am. There is a basic hypocrisy here 
There always is when meekness is absent. You see that? See, I can have this like, oh, I'm poor in spirit, Lord. I, I, I know I'm not, I'm not anybody special before you, Lord. Lord, I'm a sinner. But how, how do I relate to people? And if I don't relate to people with meekness, of this idea like, no, you know, yeah, you sinned against me. But you know what? I sin against you. And I sin against God, who has never sinned against me. Like, that is what starts to transform the heart, the affections, the mind, and our relationships across the board. Is I'm submitted to a God who has forgiven my sins. And it is that perspective constantly of holding God at that higher place of like, you are the one that matters above all else in which I can allow myself to be sinned against. And I can tell people, hey, that hurts. Hey, that hurts me. That bothers me. Can you, well, there needs to be some, uh, we need to reach out and try to reconcile, but I can also hold things loosely. That I am responsible before my life, before God, not what the other person does. I can seek forgiveness. I can ask for them to seek forgiveness. But ultimately, I'm accountable to God. I'm submitted to God. See, a life dedicated to what Christ would have me do means, yes, I will be hurt. Yes, I will be offended. I am on a daily basis. We all will be. Yes, you will be bothered by people. And yet you'll stop and look above you to this transcendent God who has loved you through all of history and all of time, through every portion of humanity, and go, where do I stand before that? Do I really stand above this person I'm angry at? As I stand before God, I do not. And that will transform your relationships across the board. It is because we don't. We make confessions with our mouth. But we do not submit our lives to God and our minds to God and our hearts to God with our everyday actions, that we are so angry at everybody around us. And we can do that individually, and we can do that corporately. See, meekness, unfortunately, this is, meekness is probably talked about as a Christian characteristic more than most qualities. This idea of humility, it is like front and center. If you are a Christ follower, I don't care if you're a Christian, apparently like 70% of America is, but if you are a Christ follower submitted to God, meekness has to be, a humility has to be an element that is trans being transformed in you. It has to be in your relationships, in the way you deal with money. These things have to change. And if they're not, there's something wrong in my submission and my commitment to God. There's something amiss. And meekness is the last characteristic of what it means to be an American. We are not a meek people. I want to get more. I want to get my rights. It's about how I feel. It's about my group. So individually, at a personal level, we are almost all too concerned with justifying ourselves rather than edifying our brothers and sisters. And at a corporate level, we are more successful at organizing rallies and political movements and flags and pressure groups and cancel groups than extending the kingdom of God. Like that is not in our minds. Lord, is this thing I'm doing, is this stuff I'm posting, is this flag I'm flying, is these words I'm saying, is this anger I'm laboring out of, is it edifying my brothers and sisters towards Jesus Christ, the greater value of this world, the thing that transcends time and history, that when America is gone, God still reigns? Am I edifying people towards that? See, we are so good, and especially Christians, we have been terrible at organizing for power. We are not a meek people. And one of the number one characteristics of what it means to be a Christ follower is humility and meekness. And you all know this. I don't have to preach or teach or talk about this. You all know it. You're watching it. Would you call this meek, this movement we're in? 
this political thing that has happened in the last decade, left and right, we organize rallies, we fight, we are angry, we're ticked, and we want to win now because we've lost an eternal perspective. We're not about the kingdom of God. We're about the kingdom of now. That is the opposite of meekness. It's why I get so offended and talk about it so often. It's so ingrained in who we are as a people. It's so ingrained with our cultural Christianity today. And it is so opposite of this passionate response of Jesus. Says, Here's what it will look like to be like me, he says. You will be a meek people. You will be characterized by your humility. And every one of us has probably fallen into that on one end of the spectrum or the other, personally and corporately. To fight for our rights, for our possessions, and divide relationships on account of these things. And not edify people towards the kingdom of God, this greater thing. That people would know Jesus Christ, that they would be submitted to him, that they would find their hope, their passion in Jesus alone. Their salvation, regardless of of where they end up on the political or social spectrum amongst you. Is the kingdom of God what you're submitted to? Then it will transform the way you relate to this world, to humanity. It'll shut you up with meekness. It'll let you hold beliefs, but hold them loosely about the now to hold to the core belief of what it means to be a Christ follower. These beatitudes, these teachings that we're learning about. Friends, this is a quote I've used since pretty much I entered into ministry, and it's something that has led me. We, are, we will become what we are committed to. We will become what we are committed to. See, commitment isn't about feelings. Commitment is a choice. I always share that when I came to faith at 20, I, you know, I always struggled with agnosticism. I've always struggled with faith. And people go, oh, when did that, when did that change in you that you just loved Jesus? And I'm like, it didn't. It didn't change here first. It actually changed here as a commitment. I said, God, I don't know. I saw some miracles. I saw some amazing things. And I said, I don't know much about you. I struggle with faith. I struggle with doubt. I always have. But I'm going com to commit to the word of God and see what happens. There's things I struggle with in the Bible. I don't know how I feel about them. I'm going to commit to them regardless and see what happens. And that one decision has transformed my life. Not because I am so passionately Christian and full of faith. Because I made a choice to commit my way, my life, to the Lord, even when I doubt it, even when I doubt my faith. I'm going to do it. That is, and so you will become what you are committed to, not what you feel, what you give your life to, what you set your course to. See, I want to go back to that graph um, when we think about submission to God, if you are committed to a cause, to your cause, to your political cause, to your social cause, here's what will happen. Personal rights. If you're committed to this idea of I need to get what I feel and what I think and, it needs, and I need my social group to exactly conform to that, you will go and change with that cause. Here's something interesting for my conservative friends. In the 1980s, the pro-immigrant group was actually conservatives, the ones who wanted to see immigrants in the nation. It was actually led heavily by our president in the 1980s. Today, that issue has changed on who supports that, right? And that's fine, everybody, but if you're a conservative, you've changed your view because your cause has changed. In the 1980s, you would have supported that. In the 2010s, you do not, because liberals do. You go with your cause, right? Cause has changed. If you're a liberal, you go with your cause. Views on social rights, on, uh, on whatever it might be, labor, it changes, so you change. 
See, you're not paid to anything because you're driven by your cause. But when you're driven by a transcendent value, it doesn't change regardless of what your social order does. It doesn't change depending on what society does. You're held to a transcendent value. Whatever the Bible says, whatever Jesus teaches, that's what you hold to. And we all like to think of ourselves as rational, but really we're social animals. We go with what we're committed to. And because I'm committed to something, I will change with that something. And because God doesn't change, if I'm submitted fully to him, that is what will keep me secure, regardless of what's happening in the world around me. Secondly is possessions. The same thing goes. If you're rich, you can be happy. If you're poor, you can be depressed. But Paul says, what? Like, hey, we're poor, but we're making many rich, but we are possessing everything. You see, his perspective is, I'm submitted to God, but you will change with how your social life goes and your possessions go. Anybody knows this. When you're high and you get the job you want and you get the money you want, then you're happy. As soon as that first mountain doesn't work, you fall apart. Because as your possessions go, so goes you, because that's what you're committed to. But when you're submitted to God and this kingdom of God, yeah, you hurt over losses. You hurt over stuff like, man, I, I, I'm worried a little bit. But you're like, I trust that God's going to provide. Guys, if you're committed to all of these things now, you will change as they change. And that is why we're in this constant wavering in society, this constant upheaval, this constant infighting, this constant anger. Because nothing is the same. We are not pegged to a transcendent value, a transcendent kingdom, a transcendent God. Something that transcends time and space. And the same thing goes with people. As your friends change, you'll give up. As people don't give you your due and treat you right, you'll divorce. You'll break up with them. You'll stop being friends. You'll stop loving them. Some of the greatest splits has happened in the last five years of friendships. I was just reading an article the other day of in the church alone, how many people have lost like long lifetime friends because of the social changes that have happened in the last five years? Lifetime friends of believers because of their view on every social change that has shifted in this world in the last five years. And that it is like a deep-seated thing. People that I would never guess would have jumped ship on me. And that's true for the majority of people because our social things change. Not because God did. Not because the scriptures did. Not because what he values changed. But because our social lives changed. Our possessions were infringed upon. Our rights have been infringed upon. And therefore, anybody who disagrees with this social change cannot be loved, cannot be a brother and sister in Christ with me. So you will move with everything you're committed to. This is what James says. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Think about your life, personal, corporate, marriage, friendships. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? It's about the person. It's inside. It's the now. You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive because you make it all about what you want and your motives, your wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. But, script, but, God, but he gives more grace. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble, the meek. Says, now listen to this. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Submit yourself to God. He connects these things. God opposes the proud, but he shows favor on the humble. You want his favor? Submit yourself to him, and he will come near to you. So when it says, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth, 
think about it, so much of our fighting is about boundaries. My possessions, the land I want, the nation I want, the way I want things, the social structures I want, my rights, my, think about your relationships. You're not doing things the way I like. You're dealing with money the ways I don't like. You're not treating me the way that I like. What causes fights and quarrels among you? The desires you have that keep shifting with what you're committed to ultimately. Your ego boundaries, it's all about boundaries. Physical boundaries, earthly boundaries, ego boundaries. And yet the scriptures say everything is already promised. Everything you're looking for is already promised. You don't need to fight. The earth is going to be restored. When Jesus Christ returns, it says the earth will be restored. You don't just escape to heaven, that there's a restoration of everything God's created, and those who love Jesus will inherit the earth. But also, even in the hardest of times, God will provide what you need to stand in it. You will get the outcomes you desire by his power. You'll get the world the way you would hope it would be by his restoration. And thankfully, you will not get your rights. Because if I got my rights, I would not be able to stand before God. Do you hear that? If I got my rights, I would not be able to stand before God. And thankfully, I will not get my rights. He will give me much, much more than I deserve. The scriptures say the old order of things will pass away, and he is doing a new thing. When we have a transcendent value we are submitted to, it changes every relationship. Our rights, our possessions, our people, the people, the way we interact with people, and the way we think of power. And the thing I want to insist upon, you know, I know... It's kind of, this is something said in, with my more liberal Christian friends is, man, we, well, Nick, that's just going to make people wait, and we're not going to do anything about injustice and brokenness, and, and, and we're not going to get involved in the hurts of the world. And I'm like, that is not what it's saying. It's that you think by doing this, you can make the kingdom of God by your power. What it is saying is that you don't join a cause that is going to overpower people and win and change things into the kingdom of God is that you join God actively in meekness going, God, how would you have me love people differently? It's going to transform my nature amongst people of different races and different backgrounds and give me more grace about people I disagree with. It's going to help me build reconciliation because reconciliation is built into the cross in our life with him. That we are reconciled to God, therefore we reconcile with brothers and sisters. I don't join a movement or a cause or a political cause. I'm transformed by the way I relate, and then I act upon the world because of that. It doesn't make you stand still and just wait for things to fall apart for God to save us. It actually changes the way you relate. Can anybody say that Jesus was disengaged? Was Je Jesus disengaged in the world? Did he sit there and just go, well, it's all going to end. I'm going to die. Y'all are screwed if you don't come follow me. No, he engaged the world. But he did it with meekness. It says it in the scriptures. He was not passive. He went about healing. He went about confronting injustice and yet loving with grace. He went about helping the hurting. And yet everybody who wanted him to be a social, political leader, he didn't make them happy. And everybody who wanted him to be a religious conservative leader, he didn't make them happy. He just simply approached things. And it says in the scriptures that he was gentle and lowly. That word gentle is the word for meek seen here in the Beatitudes. See, we said meekness is not weakness. Meekness is the desire, is having is your controlled desires submitted to serve others and the kingdom of God. Meekness is saying, I have power to do something, and I'm not going to take it out on people. I'm going to submit it to what God would have me do, because that's the greatest value I can have. And the cross was the greatest example of that. It tells us that Jesus could have called down angels and had people destroyed. 
He could have won the battle. He could have overtaken Rome. But it wasn't the end of all things. That wasn't the plan. That wasn't the transcendent plan of God. He says, Lord, may your will be done, not mine. May your will for the whole earth be done. You can overtake Rome, but guess what? There's going to be a new Rome that pops up somewhere else. You could win the battle today, and it doesn't change what's going to happen in the next century. So have a transcendent value. Lord, may your will be done. What you desire for the world around me, not the thing I want right now. That's submission. That I will go to the cross if that's what it takes for people to know you to find salvation to the ends of the earth for all of history. It's not because he didn't have power or because he was weak. He was humble because he had in mind the will of God that transcended time and the moment and the needs of now. Friends, as I close, I want to ask this. How do we submit ourselves to Jesus? You can submit yourself to Jesus and trust him because he submitted himself to God. You look at his life. As you submit yourself, as you commit yourself to his values and his promises, and you say, Lord, you ask this question, Lord, what elevates your name? If your cause doesn't elevate his name, give it up. What accomplishes your goals? If your cause doesn't build reconciliation, give it up. Lord God, how can I serve you? How can people know you? How can people see you that they might find salvation in you? If your cause doesn't build up your relationships, your rights, your possessions, give it up. That's committing yourself that, yeah, I have these other feelings, I have these other desires, I have these other things I like, but at the end of the day, I submit myself to what you would have me do. And it says you can trust that he will provide everything you need for that purpose because Jesus Christ did it. He said, God, I feel afraid. God, I don't want to go to this cross if there's any way that you could take this from me. He says, but not my will now, but may your will for everyone be done. Controlled desires submitted to the needs of others and God. And in Matthew 11, he promises this to his disciples. He says, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. He says, yeah, we're going to serve together. I'm giving you this calling. You're called to go interact with the world and serve and lead, and it's going to be hard at times, but take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Submit yourself to follow where I lead. For I am meek, gentle, and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. You know what? Jesus submitted himself to the cross for you. So you can trust him. that, And he's, he's going to lead you into things that are difficult, that are challenging, and that the fear is the reason I can't commit to God and the reason I can't submit to God is because I'm afraid that it's going to get hard and I'm going to lose out on the things I need at the end of the day. I'm afraid to enter the promised land because it might be harder and I don't trust that God's going to provide. How do I trust that? Because God carried the cross and submitted himself to us, not because he needed to, because to the will of God. He said, I submit my whole body and self so that you will find salvation. So you can trust on that promise that he will do it again. That he will, he will give you a yoke. He will lead and lead you into things that are difficult and hard, but he will not let you be weary. He will not let give up on you. He will not leave you lost and falling down the mountain. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light because he carries it with you. Later on in this teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, he says this great phrase, and it's the same idea. Seek first the kingdom of God. All of this is about the kingdom of God. Where God is in power, I submit myself to his power. And what he would say in the scriptures, it's like coming to faith that I told you about. Like, God, I don't believe some of this stuff. I'm afraid it's not going to turn out. What if I go this path and I lose all these dreams I had or these hopes I had and it gets harder? It's like, do you, commit yourself to me in faith. 
Do what it says, even if it makes you uncomfortable, and trust me that I will provide. So he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, the way he makes things right in the world. And everything else you're worried about will be added unto you as well. One focus. We will become what we are committed to. So my question is, friends, what are you committed to? I'm sure I ruffled some feathers, so think about it. What are you committed to? And if you're honest and you look back over the last 30 or 40 years, have you not changed with your causes? Have you not changed with the emotions of the time? Have you not changed with the movements of your society? Have you not changed with your possessions? And I ask you, what are you most committed to? What do you fight about? Tell your neighbor what you fight about. I'm just kidding. What do you fight about? What do you fight about in your relationships? What do you fight about at work? What do you fight about in society, in politics? What are you committed to? What is the value system you're committed to? Because that's what's changing you. When, it, when I read these studies that say over half of Christians have lost dear, lifelong friends because of the last five years of politics, liberal and conservative, it tells me what we're committed to. And it is not Jesus. And it is not the kingdom of God. It is because we've been committed to something else that changed on us. And then the second part is we are changed by who we are submitted to. Submit yourself to a love interest and you will be changed. And when that changes, so will you. Submit yourself. I will do anything I can to get love from this person. And as they go, so do your feelings, emotions, and life. Submit yourself to a boss for a work, for whatever you're submitted to. I'm going to give my life. I'm going to wake up. I'm going to give my work, my time, my effort, my mentality, my hopes. And as it goes, so will you. But we as Christians are submitted to a person, Jesus Christ, who does not change. The things he taught on the mountain to his disciples are the things he's teaching today with a promise. You can be meek. You can let loose. You can hold loosely all these things because you hold a higher value. You can talk about them. You can try to make things more right in the world, but always asking this question, how does this bring people closer to you, Lord? How does this help people see your power? How does this help people see your grace? And if it doesn't, discard it. If it separates and divides, discard it. If it breaks up your relationships, discard it. Give it away. We will be changed by who we are submitted to. Friends, I really challenge you to think about this, talk about this. We'll be talking about this on Wednesday nights in community groups, in our men's group, in our women's groups. What are you ultimately committed to? And are you willing to take the radical step of faith to say, I don't know what I believe. I'm scared. I'm afraid. I'm afraid to enter that promised land because those things look like Jeff. They're huge. <laughs> I'm afraid I will not come out on top of the mountain and go, but I'm going to commit my way to the Lord even when it is not as I would have it. And I'm going to love when it seems unfair and I'm going to serve when, I see, when I'm afraid about my possessions. I'm going to give generously to those in need, to God. Whatever it takes. And trust that if I seek your kingdom above all other values, all these things will be added to me as well. Amen? I really challenge you to think this is a leap of faith. If there's anybody here who you have not made that commitment of your life to love Jesus, would you raise your hand? to give your life to Jesus? If you would like to, I'd love to come pray for, with you. Will you guys come up here? If you would like to. If not, I can...
know some of you raised your hand, and it's okay if you don't want to. I know this can be weird, but there comes a point in time where you have to go, I don't know how I feel, but this isn't working on the first mountain. And I'm telling you as one who came to faith, not because I'm full of faith or because I'm weak-minded, but because I made a choice one day that I'm going to just do it and trust and see what happens. And I have done it with fear and timidity and doubt. And God has taken me along the pathway of transformation over many years and continuing to do so. Not because of my greatness of my faith, but because of a willingness to go, I'm going to do it regardless of how I feel and trust that it's going to work. And so far through hurts and pains and hangups, God has seen me through. So I'm asking you, if you want to Make that commitment. It's a commitment to dive your life into Jesus and see what he does with it. Is there anybody else? All right. You guys come here and let's pray. If you'll extend a hand, come on up. Lord God, thank you so much. God, that you don't require us to be perfect. That you don't require us to have tons of knowledge or perfect spirits. That you don't require us to even believe with all of our hearts yet. Lord, that you meet us. Lord God, I don't know what everybody here is carrying. And even those who aren't up here, Lord, there are people I know are probably talking to you right now. So Lord, I pray for them as well. We are carrying heavy things. And Lord, we lean on your promise that as we seek to let you lead us to put this yoke, this calling, this purpose on our life, to make our daily lives about you, that you will not make it a heavy burden, but you will begin to lift it with us. That you carry the hurts and pains of this world and the mission and the calling, the responsibilities as Christians, that you walk with us. Lord God, I thank you for everybody here. Lord, as they are here, I pray that they say this prayer. Lord, I give my life to you. You guys say, can you say it with me? Submit my daily walk to you. Lord, forgive my sins. Lord, forgive my sins. And Lord, just I, I thank you for dying and raising again. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you guys, Don. Will you guys do me a favor? Will you, um, those who came up, will you just give your names so we can just stay in contact? The important step here for everybody is that we take steps of faith and we get involved and commit our walk to the Lord. It is great to make a decision. That's your day of birth. It is also great to go, now I got to learn to walk with Christ. So we want to come alongside of you. So if you'll go to the back or talk to Sarah or go outside of the tables and just let us know uh, that we can come alongside of you and join together. Amen? God, uh, guys, let me pray for you. Lord, thank you so much for this time together. Lord God, um, we are terrible at meekness. But you know what? Most importantly, Lord, is our job is not to try to be meek. Our job is to submit our weakness to you. Lord God, I pray that you will stir everybody here, including those, yes, those who came up and those who did not, Lord. I don't care. Those who've been Christians for years, Lord, I pray that you would stir us to submit our ways, our daily lives to you, to make any change necessary, to have radical faith. That is not radical knowledge and knowing everything and believing everything. It's radical steps of faith to throw ourselves into your arms and let you lead us, Lord. I pray for the reconciliation of relationships. I pray for the reconciliation of possessions, that you would help us let loose and I pray against this culture of power and fighting and politics that has infested the church that you would break it that you would make us a people who talk more about you than what's happening today talk more about your love than what's wrong with everybody else around us may God you help us confront our own sin so that we can love with meekness the sins of this world God, will you send us 
build us, bring us together, and we, may we honor you at the end of the day that this is what it's about, that you are elevated because of what you're doing in your church body of believers. In Jesus' name, and all the people said, may God's grace and peace be with you this week.